My name is Dr. Ralph Crowder, and I'm watching and listening to Freedom Radio. And I would hope that your wider audience begins to appreciate the opportunity to see a creative, organized media that is independently sponsored and directed by African people. I'm Alan Isaacman. One of the things that many of you may not realize is that I am a beneficiary in many, many ways of your presence. I'm Alex Simba, professor of history and African studies at Fresno State University, I'm matriculated for the doctorate in the African Peoples Program and the history department at the University of Minnesota, 1970, 1977. <coughs> My name is Quintara Taylor, um, and um, I teach at the University of Washington. I'm sort of unwinding that teaching career because I officially retired, but I'm teaching part-time now. Um, I, I'm sort of reluctant to say this, but I hold the Scott and Dorothy Bullitt Chair in American History, which is the All oldest right. endowed chair at the University of Washington. But Amen. I'm there because of the training that I got at the University of Minnesota. I'll sort of loop it in and show you what happened. But at any rate, uh, I got a PhD. Well, I came to the University of Minnesota in 1969. Colleague Musa Foster, one of my many aliases. But I, I came in 1974 and I left in 1988. Um, my emphasis was on the history of African American communities in the American West. I'm Tiffany Patterson and I'm the only woman in this group. No oh, well, guys. Speak on. <laughs> <laughs> I do my undergraduate work at Indiana University in English and history. But in those days, they didn't teach about black folk. It was American history. It was Victorian English. I came to Minnesota in 1977, took a couple of courses, and met Lawson Cabo, and talked to him about what I was interested in. And of course, he encouraged me to join the African People's Program. Um, I arrived in 1978. Uh, Quintard was there in 77. I met him. Malik was already there. Uh, after me would come Joe Trotter and um, Earl Lewis. Uh, Joanna Hayes, uh, I think, was there when I came, or came shortly thereafter. And we became a, quite a group of scholars. I learned an enor as much, I think, and I don't, this is no way in, in a critique of my professors, who were fantastic, but I learned as much from our gatherings uh, at Joao's house, drinking rum, Musa uh, <laughs> uh, eating uh, jalapeno peppers for chips, <laughs> and discussing much about the African diaspora. Hi, Stuart. All right, John. What can we do? Right, right. You are correct. And uh, friends and three. <laughs> okay, can, have, can people hear him? Yeah. 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 All right, Stuart. So uh, we can hear you well. I remember Ralph Crowder, but his son is here representing Ralph not well. And so he's he's taping he's on Stuart, introduce yourself, please, because we're taping this. What do you mean? I'm Stuart Schwartz, formerly of the University of Minnesota in my better days. The position at the University of Minnesota, which I hold and have held since 1970, was created because African American students sat in wow. in Moral Hall. No, and, That's right. and then a year after that, 1969, so I owe a lot to John and to others, and a year after that, I was able to get Lonson and Cover to come here, 
and the rest is history. So let me be very, very brief. Uh, I, the second way that I owe so much to you. My connection with this actually precedes the creation of the program mm -hmm. itself because I was uh, a member of the executive committee of the African American Action Committee mm -hmm. that following the assassination of Martin King. For all practical purposes, black television began last spring following the death of Martin Luther King. After the riots, commercial and educational broadcasters, stunned by and frightened at the explosiveness of what had occurred in the cities, finally began to live up to their tarnished reputation as instruments of the public interest. A year later, many of the shows are off the air. Some lack the necessary skills and adequate resources to accomplish ambitious goals. Some were simply axed because we didn't riot last summer and things had returned to normal. Now in the days uh, after the weekend passed and 125 cities were in flames around the country, uh, we met and I drafted a list of demands mm -hmm. that we then sent to then President uh, Malcolm Moose the University, and which, as the university temporized over those things over the next seven or eight months, finally led to our taking over mm -hmm. uh, the administration building in January of 1969 which led to ultimately the creation of the Department of African American and African Studies, the Martin Luther King program, mm -hmm. of a broad review of the policies of the university towards the black athletes, creation of the first uh, recruiting admission programs for students of color, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. My participation in all that led to a, a major change in my, in my trajectory. After I left graduate school and coming in and out of graduate school, I uh, became a humanities journalist and worked for the Minnesota Institute for the Advancement of Teaching. I took every javelin throwing job uh, that dealt with racial conflict in the Twin Cities. So I established a reputation as someone who would boldly go where no one had gone before. <laughs> I took my first job at Binghamton in the history department and a joint, History and Black Studies. Then uh, after six years, I transitioned to the coordinator of multicultural infusion at Clarion University. I was given the Spelman Princeton a fellowship, the very first one they offered, and I went to Princeton for almost a year. In 1971, I graduated, and I took a job uh, in black studies at Washington State University. I stayed there for four years, and then I returned to the University of Minnesota and finished in 77, got a PhD in 77. And then I took my first teaching job at California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo, California. And I stayed there for 13 years with one year in the University of Lagos in Nigeria. Um, I am a fugitive from the sciences. My undergraduate degree was in electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. And I was in the MBA program at the time. Um, lone black student in both those programs as it were. But my engagement uh, with the Afro American Action Committee and campus events, and my you know, expanding interest in across the disciplinary lines ultimately led me my, my, to, to see my passion for really in African and African American studies. And so, with the, again, with the creation of the department and uh, yeah, the, the, its offspring, again, and, and in part, as Alan suggested, the African People's Program was in part of offspring and all that, it helped kind of me redefine my own professional career. In 1993, uh, after Spelman and after Princeton, Earl Lewis, and I, I'll always appreciate him for that, got me a visiting professorship at the University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. I finished my dissertation at the University of Michigan, thanks to Earl, and I went from there to uh, Binghamton University in 1994. In that same year, Earl and I, no, Four years later, Earl and I got into a conversation on the phone about this program, about African Diaspora Program. We started out talking about how we made it through all those books that Alan and Lonson used to give us. And it was so cool. We had to read them too. Yeah, well, I don't care. You read them, you worked the hell out of us. And how did we get through all of those books? And we were chatting about it, and I told him I was working on a paper about diaspora and what it means and what it was coming out of the African People's Program. 
and we chatted and he told me that Robin Kelly was working on something very similar and why shouldn't we come together? Mm -hmm. Well, Robin and I did and Earl had to drop out because he got promoted to, as the graduate dean of the University of Michigan. And I proceeded with uh, Robin, who I knew because I met him when he was at Emory University. Um, and together he had some pieces and I had pieces and we finished an article in, uh, that was published in the African Studies Review in May of 2000. And the, uh, it was a special issue, and our article was the lead article, uh, which was, um, I think it was uh, Judy Byfield, who's an Africanist, that also was one of the contributors to that volume. It became one of the most uh, bought and sold out volumes of the African Studies Review, and it's, I, am, I am proud to say it is still being read. In 1990, I took a position at the University of Oregon, thinking I was going to stay there for the rest of my career. Um, I stayed there for almost 10 years. I was department head for the last three of those years. And then in yeah, 1999, I got the opportunity of a lifetime to apply to the position at the University of Washington. And I did, and I got it. I was surprised that I got it, but I got it. And so I've been there ever since. I ran the Martin Luther King program while I was in graduate school and taking courses in African peoples and American studies between 1970 and 73. And uh, during those years, Lana Sine was teaching at Carleton on and off. Of course, right. down there. there were no black faculty at Carleton, no program, no major, African, anything, so forth. And when I finished my prelims, Lana Sine, um, Mm -hmm. pointed the, 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 the dean at Carleton College to, to me and ultimately they recruited me to come to Carleton mm -hmm. and to develop a major in African American and African Studies. Mm -hmm. So I spent a decade at Carleton doing it, building that, mm -hmm. the, that major and that program, at which point Lansane and Russ right. Hamilton again intervened in my life and convinced me to return to the university uh, where I, <laughs> within a few months, again, became chair of the department, chaired it for the next uh, uh, couple of terms, and so on. I said what I had to say, and I got involved with other, by other professors in my department and transforming the department into a, a more global space. So I've been uh, the chair of the history department at uh, Fresno State, and I was the, the chair when all the senior white faculty were retiring. So I was able to recreate the history department by hiring progressive uh, white faculty. And they're all scholars, all got books out and so forth. So I actually led that trans transformation with history department. I, I teach courses on race matters. Uh, that covers the Atlantic world and so on. I won't go into much more. We, I'm also co-editor of the journal, which now has become self-sustaining. It's called Palimpsest, mm -hmm. a journal of women and gender and the black international. Um, we started it with SUNY Press at their invitation, and Tracy and I are the senior editors, and it stands on its own at this point. Uh, I come from uh, a preaching family, a uh, fundamentalist, but I'm not a fundamentalist, but I, beginning in 2009, was a student, a uh, master's student in divinity at the University of Minnesota. I'm sorry, at the United Theological Seminary, the United Theological Seminary at the Twin Cities. I was able to publish both in uh, multicultural studies and in uh, the field of gender studies and sexual violence. And I want to turn back to the University of Minnesota. All these positions I got are because of Stewart and Lonson A. Kava and <laughs> Alan Spear and all of the other people who worked really, really hard to get all of us through yeah. the university. Again, all the, you know, the training that I had had in the African Peoples Program uh, you know, came increasingly to the fore for me, both in terms of my own research and in the, some of the programmatic objectives I laid out. It worked out, uh, and I'm really proud of my association with the university. I, one final thing, we have a website called blackpast.org. Yeah, yeah. It has about 13,000 pages of history, African-American, global African history. And the reason I mention global African history is because I learn global African history in the African People's Program. If I hadn't done that, I don't think that website would focus on people of African ancestry around the world. So you 
and Lanzane and the others are directly responsible for that connection. I ended up uh, starting the initiative community, community and University Partnership mm -hmm. to acquire and develop what's now known as the Archie Gibbons Senior Collection of African American Literature and Life, which is one of the largest such repositories in the country and has been the, you know, the source of all kinds of you know, community outreach and educational projects and so on over the years. So my book is entitled Black Marxism and American Constitutionalism from the colonial background oh, to the ascendancy of Barack Obama Ooh. and the dilemma of Black Lives Matter. Hey. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, hey. Congratulations. There, there are people from all over the world, people from six continents who write for Black Pass. Alan's going to join soon and <laughs> to work on others to see if they will contribute. Uh, Black Pass may have, I'm not going to guarantee it, but we may have Five million visitors for the first time. Whoa! Uh, and, uh, and, and you know, we get visitors for the big cities, you know, New York, Chicago, and all. But I'm very proud of the fact that number 12 on the list is Nairobi. Number 14 on the list is Lagos, and that's again the legacy that we were introduced to here, um, introduced to here at the University of Minnesota. And that's five million this year. Five million this yeah. year, five this million this incredible. year. Yeah. yeah, I think probably 20 million have used, more than 20 million have used the website uh, in its existence. You have to create a place where you can be both an activist and a scholar. Yes. And that was very, very important to me, from my own background uh, involved with the Mozambique Liberation Movement. I remember writing an, a, a paper for Alan, uh, and we were meeting at Alan's house at that time. It was a seminar, and I think you all remember it. And uh, but I had to get my paper reviewed with Alan just before the seminar started. And it was a, it was on South Africa. It was on the role of the South African secret police mm -hmm. in destabilizing uh, the struggle of Frelimo in Mozambique. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was I did a bang up job on that paper <laughs> until I sat down with Alan. <laughs> And he took a pen and started on page one and then stopped to page 40, except to give me a box of Kleenex on the way. You did. You kept right on talking, okay? I had to get some band-aids. And, uh, and then in the midst of my uh, tears and, and dripping nose, uh, he gave me a B and, I, and he said, rewrite it. And I said, why should I rewrite it, you know? And then. Um, he went on to tell me that I had left out sources, Portuguese sources, and I said, well, I couldn't find them. He said, you didn't ask me. I'm the top three Mozambican <laughs> historian in the whole world. You never asked me one question. Oh, and the sources are in my office. They're oh, not in the library. Oh, oh. I never forgot that, and I tell my students this story a lot to get them to make the point. And then you were also people, uh, each very different, and having your own personality, who demonstrated that that diversity and academic excellence are not in contradiction, but actually are mutually reinforcing. So you make the university a better place. I learned an enormous amount from you. I subsequently, with the help of Bobby, have written many books, destroyed many trees. <laughs> After independence, I, was, I and Bobby were invited by President Michelle to teach at the university. I've been going to Milan. I'm currently a Regents Professor here at the University of Minnesota. Again, I owe a lot of that to you. And an extraordinary professor at the University of Western Cape. The fellowship of men and women in this program, which also includes uh, the late Gloria Ali, mm -hmm. who was killed yes. uh, tragically yeah, uh, while she was at the master's level, killed tragically in a snowstorm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, uh, I, you all have really kept me buoyant and intellectually alert. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would make an observation, uh, personal observations, uh, you know, those who may be taking on that profession um, at that particular time, uh, I don't think the course of that activity was comfortable. I think there was a lot of struggle uh, personally and collectively to even develop a Department of uh, African Studies. I think the, um, the scholars who chose those 
different areas of research and engaged in community. Um, took tremendous amount of pressure um, individually and collectively in terms of how that may or may not have impacted their own personal families. And um, uh, some of us, or some of you made it, I mean, some of you may have not. Um, and those stories and how it may have uh, contributed to uh, keeping your family dynamic together uh, is also an interesting uh, area of research yeah. and documentation I think that needs to come out generationally yeah um, obviously I represent the children of that era mm -hmm. that is now adults that can look back on maybe the struggles of their fathers or their mothers or their families and that are playing out in real time now mm -hmm. and whatever we see happening in the community mm -hmm. um, I think that generational discussion is, is very important. I think I've seen some scholarship that are coming out that are broadening the research of, of, um, of that particular area of 68 to 75, specifically from people my age in the field of academia um, that I'm enjoying kind of looking at because it's coming from a perspective of the child growing up in that. And um, yeah. I think ultimately that your age group and my age group have a story to tell. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. And many times the struggles, the success, the positive and the negative, uh, the children were watching their parents. Mm -hmm. yeah. I challenge you to bridge those gaps in communication if they're not there. Because um, there is a need for understanding, healing, and connection uh, in a very real way. And if uh, those of us who say that we value um, ourselves, uh, our history, our culture, um, if we say that, then we have to be what we say. So I just thank you for having this. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A college education is not something that you get just so you can get a better job. No, an education is a tool, mom. It's a tool you use to, to help your people. Hey, man, you coming? Yeah, I'm coming, man. I'm coming. See, Mama, Mama, Dad wants me to play it safe. He wants me to join the system. If I did that, Mama, I'd, I'd be turning my back on everything that I believe in. I guess you're right. We always taught you to stand up for what you believe in. <laughs>